at Ruby, and today we are discussing the topic of the next generation of food and health. And I'm joined uh, today by uh, with Dan Merrick, who's a good friend, a colleague, and uh, Dan is the school program manager for the Whole Kids Foundation and a chef educator. So we're really happy to bring this conversation to all of you, and we're going to keep uh, this very, very conversational today with with Dan. So um, just wanted to start off by uh, by thanking all of you for coming and. Um, you know, really just uh, encouraging all of you to ask some questions if you have any during this session. But I'm gonna go ahead and kick this off, Dan, and just um, ask you the starting question of how did you um, initially develop your interest in food and cooking with that lens towards health? Wow, it started really young, actually. My mom actually ran a health food store when, uh, when I was born and uh, for years raised, you know, in a very health conscious kind of mindset. We grew up right, um, I grew up right across the street from a farm. So we actually got our local ingredients pretty quickly and easily like that. Um, you know, I went through a number of careers through my life, but really started focusing on it as a career about 15 years ago when I started working for Whole Foods Market and then worked in their health and wellness, um, you know, avenue for uh, cooking and really started focusing on uh, cooking towards that same aspect. And since then, you know, have moved on to uh, the foundation that's supported by Whole Foods Market called Whole Kids Foundation, where our, you know, real mission is to support schools and inspire families through improving children's nutrition and wellness. So it's been a great adventure in that, um, you know, it's, it's really given me an opportunity to take my knowledge and put it towards a larger machine of school food and look at that in ways to be able to inspire uh, adults to be able to get kids better, you know, information about nutrition too. Awesome. Yeah, I know since uh, we've gotten to know each other over these, these years, um, you know, your connection to food obviously runs really deep. I think something we share, um, you know, like you, I grew up in a household that was really concerned with food and with health. Uh, both of my parents are health professionals and my mom grew up on a farm and we kept a huge garden growing up and had books about vegetarian cooking and cooking around the world and books about food and health even uh, when I was a kid. So for me, um, maybe I took for granted that connection from an early age that I was uh, being informed in a food system that was very much eyes and ears open to you know, some of the things that we'll get into today, the connections around food, where food comes from, uh, what it means to people, what it means for families. Yeah. And then, you know, those bigger questions about um, health and the environment and, and everything else. Uh, I think it's a tremendously important baseline to start with. And one of the things that I'm personally really interested in doing and part of my kind of my personal professional goals in life is to really find those ways to help people understand how they can personally connect to food and create a better relationship to food. And, you know, I, I have a goal around health that might not be as strong in everyone, but I think it's one of the natural consequences of discovering food and appreciating food is that there's a natural health conversation that um, emerges from there. Um, I, I think that's interesting that you bring that up because you know our generation, like we were very unique people in our generation where we were focused on food at an early age. And a lot of people our age didn't have that focus at all. But if you look at the generation that you know is coming up today, it was something that they're very interested in um, from a very early age where, you know, I, I often say that, you know, our generation was raised on, you know, cartoons and stuff like that, but today they're raised on like culinary shows and MasterChef Junior and stuff. And it's something that, you know, inspires this generation a lot, um, you know, beyond just putting a meal in front of them to be able to eat, but, uh, you know, looking at the sense of adventure in the kitchen, which I love, um, you know, and that's, it's a, a wonderful thing to be able to see um, from a culinary background, um, to be able to see so many people and so many kids really interested in food and cooking and um, you know experimenting with it to be able to get nourishment, but also to have fun with it and to feed others too. Yeah, it's, uh, it is interesting to look at the, the past you know, 10, 20, 30 years even. I think you're right. Um, you know, both of our backgrounds are sort of unique in that we had this very close early relationship to food. It certainly informed who we are and what we're doing and why we're doing it today. Uh, young people, I, I would agree, they're, they're driven by, you know, younger people today are driven by something 
completely different. For me, learning about food um, was, you know, obviously like important in lots of different ways. I took sort of a cultural direction as a food anthropologist, but a lot of it ultimately was just very practical. Like I wanted to find things that would be satisfying and to feed myself or even feed my family. At an early age, I started cooking for my family when I was very young. Um, but it was also something that, you know, I, as a young person framed as a hobby, as a pleasure, something that I did for joy, for uh, my own kind of, you know, self-fulfillment. Um, when I talk to people today, you know, younger people um, around, you know, people in their 20s and 30s in particular around food, they still have all those same inklings around the practicalities, right? The getting the dinner on the table and, and making food taste great and fun. But there's this really deep sense of food as um, identity and food as meaning. And um, I'd love to kind of hear your thoughts, Dan, about that in particular when it comes to the huge surge in plant-based interest and the connection that people are showing between kind of, you know, eating more plants and those identity factors, those things that kind of yeah. help define who you are. So. Right. Well, I mean, that's, it's, it's a huge uh, thing that, you know, a younger generation has really looked at. And part of that is the ethics of it. Um, you know, they, the younger generations are definitely looking at like where their food is coming from, where it's being sourced from the, um, you know, who is giving their food, like what country it's coming from. And that's something that's important right from the get go um, for them. And it's something, um, you know, most of us have just only come to recently where we're finding like country of origin, you know, for fruits and vegetables at the grocery store. Um, but there's something that, you know, they've grown up with, you know, labels like organic, you know, like uh, when I was a kid, organic wasn't even a thing at all. Like it just wasn't in existence. Um, you know, at least the label on it, you know, our, our great grandparents, that's all they ate, you know, or, or organic. They just didn't call it that. Um, so to be able to see, you know, kids and, you know, young adults really is what we're talking about. Young adults looking at things and looking at the ethics of their food, I think is a wonderful thing to be able to get them to um, not only look at the ethics of it, but eat healthier at the same time, because a lot of those different things that they're looking for are actually making their diet healthier. When it comes to plant-based eating, um, you know, there are a lot of people uh, that are really starting to look at that not only as a health conscious thing, but also, um, you know, as a spiritual thing or just, you know, looking at that ethically for, do you want to harm an animal to be able to put on your plate to be able to feed yourself? I mean, just in the past two years, the plant-based um, industry has risen by 29 percent, you know, since 2017 um, up to 2019, which is huge, you know, um, and really leading in that is actually milk. Uh, that's really um, where a lot of that growth is coming from is um, plant-based milks. And some of that, you know, is coming from, you know, uh, like the, the mentality of, looking at what uh, animal milk is going towards and like um, how you're consuming it. Like I've heard a lot of, you know, young adults being like, well, why would I consume cow milk? I'm not a cow, you know? And that's a common argument for, for kids now to be able to look at that. And school systems too, you know, I've seen this transformation happen through the USDA where it used to be required that every kid took the milk off of uh, the line and it was required that they took that with them. And a couple of years ago, the USDA got rid of that requirement because they literally saw so many kids throwing that milk away at the end of the lunch line um, because it was not something that they wanted. So now that restriction has been taken away and they're able to take it as they want. So I think it's you know a wonderful thing to be able to see this surge in plant-based eating, um, especially for our health. And I'm not saying everybody has to go vegan by any means, but um, I think it's great to be able to see vegetables and fruits as the center of the plate more where it takes up a lot more of that plate. You see things like the USDA re releasing my plate a number of years ago and showing you know portions out where um, only a quarter of the plate being proteins and they're not even naming it as a meat where it could be beans or tofu or tempeh. Um, you know, but literally making half that plate for fruits and vegetables, um, you know, so I think it's a wonderful thing that's happening um, in a generation that's been grown up with these different resources that we didn't have. And I'm, I'm sure you're seeing this too. I mean, in just your own kids being able to see this and their interest in that and their interest in cooking the other day, you know, the two of us were talking about 
um, you know, one of your kids getting up and cooking to be able to, uh, you know, in the middle of the night to be able to get, you know, to, because of being hungry. And I love that story because it's like, you know, I'm thinking of my kids who are much, much younger, but to see them just go into the kitchen and cook their own meal, I think is a wonderful thing. So, um, you know, but I don't know, what are your thoughts on the whole, the plant-based transition for kids? I think it's a, it's, yeah, it's, it, definitely... it, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a new world for, I think, young people in the plant-based space. There's number one, so many options and availability of products that you can identify at the store or pre-COVID at restaurants that were very easy to identify that were delicious and plant-based options. I think for me, the, the biggest shift, um, and I've been watching this plant-based space for some time, um, 30, 30 plus years, um, has been really the appeal of plant-based products for people who I don't identify as being vegan or vegetarian or at all plant-based. People who just acknowledge that maybe they want different things to eat sometimes. They might even acknowledge that they might feel better um, after eating different products, or they might want something that's lower impact in terms of carbon footprint or the environmental impact. They just want to try new things. So I think you know, right out of the gates, there's just a lot more options for people. It's not just tofu and beans as your options or just pasta primavera on the menu and that sort of a thing. Uh, I do also think that um, there's something really interesting in terms of the storytelling and the sense that younger people have about um, identifying and creating a values-based orientation that you know what they dress, what they do, what they listen to, what they cook and eat is all a reflection of themselves. And because in particular of social media, um, how those things circulate, even if you're not participating, you're still observing, um, those things circulate in really uniquely powerful, interesting ways to um, influence people, to say to people, hey, you know, uh, this is this very, um, you know, attractive, you know, athlete who's vegan or plant-based and they're just as strong or just as fast or just as sexy or just as cool or whatever as the next person. And that's attractive to people, right? It's no longer um, niche. It's become mainstream in, in a way, even to the point where because it's alternative, I think people want to take a second look at it and go, wow, that's interesting. It's getting momentum. It's getting traction. It's got some different language around it, right? People pick up on that because there's an edge to it and they're curious as a result. Um, what I love about the way that it gets articulated in real life is that people ultimately see a lot more choice and we're seeing a lot more fluidity in how people approach that. Yeah, I'm interested in plant-based. Um, again, not maybe not trying to become vegan, but I'm interested in plant-based because there's so much potential for creativity and flavor and pleasure but also all those values orientations that that exist there. Yeah, I think it's really cool to see the um, the surge in the plant based meats, like the, you know, the Beyond Burgers, and um, you know th that you know, kind of surge towards like meatless Mondays too. And you see people like you know, I I grew up across a farm, and my family were all hunters, you know. But to see at a barbecue last year them eating, you know, the Beyond Burger kind of thing, I was I was personally a little taken aback. But they were just like, yeah, you know, I got to lower my cholesterol, and this is the way I found to be able to do it. And that's wonderful because that's how they, um, you know, approached uh, plant based, you know, eating. And by no means are they, you know, giving up their meat at all. They're just choosing different ways to be able to make that to be able to make that change for themselves. Um, and, you know, part of that big surge is because of their kids and their kids are helping them to be able to kind of find these products. Just like you said, like, you know, the, um, you know, the, the social media things are a great way for, you know, people to be able to find out about that. And, you know, younger generations are just, they grew up with it. They know it. it's like secondhand nature for them. So for them to be able to find alternative means for, um, you know, for foods and to be able to uh, not only find them, but to be able to prepare them is great. I mean, just the surge on, you know, the surge in online um, content to be able to cook like Ruby, I think is a, a great thing, um, you know, and 
every kid, when they have a question about something, a lot of times they'll go to, you know, YouTube to start <laughs> to be able to find out how to do something. And if they've never made a burger before, they're probably going to go YouTube it and figure out how to be able to make that happen. Um, so I think it's a, it's a great change that we're seeing, um, you know, of more information. We saw a lot of speakers today, like Dr. Scott Stoll, that really kind of show, you know, some of the proof that's happening in that. Um, you know, you're talking about uh, plant-based athletes. There was the, the film, The Game Changers, that came out really, uh, was that last year that really opened up a lot of people's eyes to uh, a plant-based lifestyle um, and what just little amounts um, can do to be able to change um, your metabolism, your performance, um, you know, and it's a, it's a pretty amazing thing to be able to see. And I love that kids are seeing that really early so they can start earlier to be able to make those systematic changes happen. Yeah, great. Let's uh, change tracks just a little bit and in the frame around the next generation of health and kind of thinking about um, the next generation, you know, coming up through the ranks in terms of learning to cook. This is so much of what we're doing at Ruby is um, trying to create this ecosystem. So you now have uh, professional chefs being trained in certain more health supportive ways. You have people at home who are now being equipped with some of these cooking techniques and these tools, these ways of thinking about food that are also going to be uh, health supportive. Um, what are those other ways, Dan, that you think, you know, outside of online, you know, getting people, more people in, interested and, you know, getting it kind of from this perspective of chefs and home cooks and, and building that base, what are some other things, those mechanisms you think that we should be uh, pulling on to increase how effective we're being from a systems perspective? Yeah, um, you know, that's a good question. I, I think that the way I did it early was I went to older generations to be able to find out right away. And I think that's something um, that people should do a lot more is to be able to find out some of those techniques and mm. some of the flavor profiles. Because, I mean, the country being so diverse and so, um, you know, culturally, we have so many different uh, menus at home, right? So, uh, it's a good thing to be able to go to the grandmothers and great grandmothers to be able to be like, okay, like, how do I do this recipe? That's one of my favorite things to be able to do it. And they show you from beginning to end um, on things, how to, on how to be able to make that recipe. Um, I'm a huge believer in the online formats. And I think that Ruby is a great format to be able to do that because not only are you training chefs, but you're, like you said, you're training home cooks um, and it's approachable, you know, where you can, um, start off with a menu, but at the core of it, what you're learning is a technique. And I think that those techniques are the things that, those are the things you add into your toolbox. You know, like recipes can be something that change over time where, um, you know, something that was popular just a couple of years ago might not be as popular a couple of years from now. But if you have the techniques on how to be able to build those things, you know, I think that's really at the key of how to be able to learn, to be able to cook for yourself is adding incrementally to your skill set as you go. So, um, you know, on day one, you're not going to be able to do everything. But mm -hmm. if you just learn like one meal and learn how to make that one meal really, really well, um, and then next week you learn to do a different one, you just keep adding those into it. So. I think part of that is just a little bit of practice, you know, from either asking, you know, mentors, uh, learning online a bit as well too. But just remember that, you know, it's not all going to happen at once. That you need to practice it, just like any other skill set that you have. But it's something that you can take on with you for the rest of your life. Um, yeah, that's a great. It's a great sentiment. I think one of the things that I always think about when I think about the future and what's next and who's going to take the reins and those sorts of things is. You know, what are those things that I'm missing? What are those blind spots, those things that I'm not looking at, those corners I'm not turning around? And oftentimes it's, you know, right in front of you. It's the thing where, um, you know, it's that, it's that book that's been on the shelf that you just haven't looked at <laughs> in a long yeah. time. And it's revisiting old wisdom, applying some new thinking to it. Um, it's amazing with Ruby and Ruby is, you know, a 15 year old online company and certainly during COVID times, but even before then, um, so much of what we're trying to do is create this ecosystem around cooking, the behavior of cooking very particularly. And because we've been around and doing this for so long, we've had students, you know, who came to us just to learn to cook as a trade. Maybe it was something to get the job and it was maybe something very classical, very Eurocentric kind of, you know, 
what you'd expect in a traditional culinary school curriculum. And it was great. They're, they're working, they're learning. Um, and then they come back to us because we have some additional programming, um, maybe in plant-based, maybe in some more health supportive type cooking, because those are things that they either never learned with us at the beginning, or they never learned when they went to culinary school. Those are just not areas of focus. So I love also that people are going to relearn things. They're going to learn how to how to saute with less oil or no oil. They're going to learn how to make grains that maybe when they had those in the past, they, they didn't taste right. They tasted off or they weren't flavored well. And now you're like, well, I can change my technique. I can change my flavor base. I can apply some new ingredients I didn't use before. And to me, that's, that's the amazing part is that with food, you have the opportunity with every meal to make a slightly better decision, to tweak it, make the recipe work a little bit better. Um, yeah. That's the beauty of, of food. It's, it's, it's so regular and so persistent in our lives that um, I always tell people like, if it doesn't work out well one day, well, you know, go to bed, you wake up the next morning, you're hungry again, you can try again, <laughs> you yeah. have another shot, so. Yeah, I, I love that too, because once you learn those core techniques, you know, you can apply them to all kinds of different things. So um, if you want to change up the ethnicity of a dish, that's actually, you can just change up um, the ingredients that you had. And just like you said before, like maybe one of your students, you know, was only doing like rice and beans earlier, but maybe, you know, like farro is a much more, uh, you know, it's a, an ingredient that you can find a lot more at other grocery stores or quinoa, you know, where 15 years ago, quinoa was not a household word, but now people know what it is and they, you know, might not know how to cook it. Uh, so being able to kind of revisit those things is a great thing. And that's just, again, part of those techniques. Um, and the more you do that, you can take that quinoa and turn it into, um, I don't know, maybe like, uh, like something you'd, typically do a couscous with or something like that, you know? Um, you know, so it's great to be able to kind of switch those up a little bit and uh, take new directions with cooking and be adventurous. I always tell people like, don't listen to your parents. You're allowed to play with your food from now on, um, <laughs> you know? And I think that's a great way to be able to look at it is experiment with a bit. Like the worst thing you're gonna get is a bad meal, you know? <laughs> like, um, right. you know, so changing it up, I think, you know, the next day is a great thing. You're gonna wake up and be hungry again. Yeah, what are, what are those things that you look towards when you when you make that quinoa? It doesn't turn out the way you you wanted, or your kids make a face at it. Like, what are those things you look towards <laughs> to um, to kind of move forward to say, hey, we're not going to throw the quinoa away. We're going to do something different next time. We're going to make it more appealing. We're going to serve it differently. Maybe it's a smaller portion. Um, yeah, you know, whatever it is. So, you know, typically with something like you, it's flavor profiles to be able to switch in, in ingredients, you know? So you might've made something with a quinoa dish that had, I don't know, say like Mexican profiles in it. And you'd had chili powder and cilantro or something in like, in like that. And maybe you have one of those people that are like, uh, you know, like um, I'm not a big fan of cilantro. It tastes like soap to me. Um, so the next time you look at it, you say, well, maybe I'm going to do something more like um, in an Israeli style and put a lot of garlic and a lot of parsley and maybe some, you know, sun-dried tomatoes in it to be able to kind of switch that flow, flavor profile completely on it. Um, you know, when my, uh, my kids are not liking something as well, I'll try to switch that up a little bit too, to be able to make that work for us. Um, and that's usually on the fly. And it's just kind of what's in my fridge at the moment. And I think that partly takes a little bit of practice. Like I'm used to being able to do that where, um, you know, but I'm also a little different. Uh, like I'll prep out my entire kitchen for the week. So I have a bunch of ingredients all set up. Um, you know, and I mean, I, when I get home from the grocery store, I get out a cutting board and I cut up all my vegetables and put them in the fridge so I can easily pull them out and use them. So if one of my kids doesn't like a dish that I put on the plate, I'm able to adapt that dish pretty quickly, um, on the fly, but that's not everybody, you know, and, um, it, it definitely takes a little bit of practice to be able to get there, but thinking on your toes, um, having a good toolbox, um, and, being, you know, a, you know, adaptable, I think, you know, and that's kind of the 2020 theme, you know, as well as <laughs> we're all, you know, we have to be adaptable and uh, with your food, it kind of, you know, makes that same thing. You have to be able to change it up to, um, you know, fit the flavor profile of the day because kids, you know, they might hate something today, but next week it might be their favorite thing too. 
So, yeah. you know, revisiting that, that. I think that in itself is an important lesson to remember, right? That our food tastes, our habits are not at all static or fixed. We are highly malleable. We can change our minds. Uh, we should celebrate that. I think that, you know, sure, we can get stuck in a rut and sure we have favorite foods. We have our patterns and our habits. But um, I think that's an incredible lesson to share is that, you know, with times of change, humans are incredibly, uh, you know, responsive, they can be resilient, they can be creative, they can find ways um, to turn that, that quinoa that wasn't great into something delicious that, that next time. Um, yeah. For me, a lot of it also is just how it's framed. It's the narrative, it's the story we tell around it. And, uh, you know, what I like in particular about thinking about the future of food and health is, uh, you know, all the things that have yet to be seen, all those things that, that young people are going to uncover or discover uh, that we weren't even thinking about. They're going to fix problems we didn't even know we had made yet. Um, yeah. They're going to, uh, you know, certainly come at this from a much different approach than what we might. And I think that's that's pretty amazing. That's one of the things to celebrate and um, would love to kind of get your thoughts on what, what that looks like for you in terms of that, you know, turning over those reins to those, those, those younger people. Well, I think, you know, turning over the reins is something that we have to, you know, just gracefully do, um, you know, and the best thing we could do is be able to instill the knowledge that we do have. Um, but as we know, as people in the food service world or have worked in the food service world, things change over time. And uh, part of that is being adaptive to that as well. Um, one of the things that's not so adaptive is seasonality. And I think that, you know, looking at foods, people really need to focus on seasonality of foods a lot more because you get more nutrients out of it. You get more flavors out of it, more vitamins. I think it's an important thing to be able to teach younger generations about how to follow that seasonality of food too. Um, so, yeah, I mean, what, what would you say to that same question to throw it right back at you? Yeah, I think, um, I think just giving people the room and the grace to, to find their way and to make mistakes and to kind of write their own book in terms of what gives them joy, what gives them meaning. Um, so much of how I'm trying to frame the food conversation is not to have people emulate what I did or what I'm working towards, but for people to kind of chart their own course, find, you know, find the things that matter to them and then build, build that, that base. So you can support that. And um, it doesn't even have to be something I agree with. I just, I just want people to be passionate and to have a position that strongly signals that relationship to food. And to me, that's the foundation that people need to move forward because again, it's dynamic. It's going to change. It's going to um, evolve as you evolve, as you become a parent or, a grandparent or as your health changes. So um, really, really interesting uh, conversation here. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, we are all out of time. I just wanted to, again, um, thank Dan for uh, participating and joining me in this conversation and thank everyone at Crisonia for hosting this incredible forum and uh, we really appreciate your time. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs>